Good morning. morning. Welcome to Faith Free Lutheran Church. Nice to see all of you here with us this morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. He is risen. He is is risen risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. We open this worship service now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I invite you to stand and join with us in our call to worship. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 112. We'll sing together now, The Green Blade Rises. Hymn number 112. bow together before the Lord and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us, and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on His name, He gives power to become the sons of God and bestows on them His Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. This time I would invite you to stand as you are able in respect for the reading of God's Word. The first reading today is taken from Acts 20, verses 17 through 35, and that can be found on page 1729 in the Pew Bible. Acts 20, 17 through 35. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order, in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And then the other lesson this morning is taken from Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 17, and this is found on page 1921 in the Pew Bible. Revelation 7, 9 through 17. And just a, a, a quick comment here. The, when we read this, we're going to be reading about a great multitude dressed in white robes and so on. Just so that we're aware, if, if any of you have loved ones, who have died in the faith. Uh, what we're reading here is a description of them. Okay? So be aware of that. And, and, and if you want, as we read through this and you think of your loved one who, who died in the faith, this is a picture of, of what they're experiencing. We read in Jesus' name. After this, I looked, 
And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in the white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here ends the reading of the scripture lesson for today. And now it is with great joy and delight that we join together with the church for all time and in all places to confess our holy Christian faith. This morning we are using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever. seated. This time we'll call forward our ushers to receive our morning offerings.
Again, special welcome to those of you who are visiting us this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I would at this time invite you to stand as I read the gospel lesson appointed for this Sunday. The sermon text is taken from John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30, can be found on page 1667 of your Pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. Reading in Jesus' name, John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Heavenly Father, these are your words, and your word is truth. We pray that this morning you would sanctify us in the truth, that you would convict us of sin in our lives where that is necessary, and that you would comfort and encourage us with the promises of your gospel. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So much of Jesus' life and ministry seems to have boiled down to mistaken identity. The Pharisees didn't believe who Jesus claimed to be and thought that he was someone else. Most of the crowds that followed Jesus wanted him to be someone else, that he wasn't. The disciples during Holy Week and especially after the resurrection had trouble piecing together exactly who Jesus was. And even today, the church can regularly turn itself upside down, puzzling through who Jesus is. So many church bodies and individual congregations try to mold Jesus into their own image. Others chase after the promise of a better more accurate Jesus based on what we think about ourselves that the culture of the day tells us we are. But for Jesus, the entire issue of his identity was quite simple and quite solvable. It all came down to his voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. But how does that help sort things out for us? Doesn't every Christian on the planet and every Christian for all time think they're hearing and following Jesus? Yes. But Jesus gives us an important distinction this morning. In our efforts to hear and follow Jesus, we must pay attention to his voice. We must pay attention to the words that we're hearing and following, because it comes down to this. If you're not hearing the voice of Jesus, then you're hearing another voice. So turning our eyes back to John 10 this morning, first we'll see that if you're not hearing Jesus, you're probably hearing your own voice. This was the problem of the Pharisees during Jesus' day. How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. But the problem was, at least for the Pharisees, that as soon as they asked this question of Jesus, they weren't looking to listen to him. They weren't trying to hear his voice. They were looking for an excuse not to believe. 
Already, and only in the Gospel of John, the crowds, which included the Pharisees, have seen Jesus do many marvelous things. He's healed the man born blind. He's healed another man at the pool of Bethesda. He's healed an official's daughter. On top of that, he's fed the 5,000, and he's turned water into wine at the wedding at Cana. In addition to all this, John has recorded for us the words of Jesus, sermon after sermon that begin to add up in the Gospel of John. And through it all, the Pharisees were there, and through it all, it didn't matter. Because the Pharisees don't want to hear Jesus' voice. They don't want to know who Jesus is. They've reached a point in their lives where they want their own voice to be the voice of the Savior. This is evident in the very next chapter in John's Gospel when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. This might be... And for, for my opinion at least, the most dramatic miracle that Jesus does before his death in any of the four Gospels. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, but he raises a dead, and for all intents and purposes, mummified Lazarus out of the grave. Lazarus hasn't just died. He, he, he's not there on the hospital gurney. Lazarus, to, to quote or paraphrase maybe another uh, movie, is all the way dead. He's not mostly dead. He's not partially dead. He's all dead. <coughs> and Jesus calls him out of the tomb. He, he doesn't go into the tomb. He, he, he doesn't do any magic incantation or anything like this. Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And we will note here that Lazarus hears the voice of his shepherd. And Lazarus comes. But the Pharisees, the ones who don't want to hear Jesus' voice, what do they do in response to Lazarus? In response to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? First, they get together and plot to kill Jesus because Jesus is in danger of taking away their favored place in society. He's going to undercut the entire system. But more than that, and I challenge you to read all of John 11 this afternoon. Read it from beginning to end and read it thoughtfully. The Pharisees, in response to the resurrection of Lazarus, plot to kill Lazarus. Imagine that. Imagine being so unwilling to hear the voice of the shepherd that you not only ignore him, but that you want to erase all evidence that his voice exists in the first place. But here's the point for us this morning. The Pharisees aren't alone in their desire to hear Jesus. This is the response of our sinful nature as well. We want our voice to be the voice of the Savior. Because our voices are the most important voices in our own lives. We've been raised to be true to our authentic selves. We've been taught to listen to our heart. We've been cultivated by our phones and by our computers that the very act of having an opinion means others must want to hear our opinion. In our constant reaction to make God prove himself time and time again, what matters in our lives are our own voices that make demands of God so that God would serve us and do our bidding. Having faith in Jesus is the hardest thing to do when the occupation of our hearts 
is constant idolatry. My sheep hear my voice. But if you're not hearing the voice of Jesus, I would also suggest you might be hearing the voice of the law. One other reason why we might not be hearing Jesus' voice, why it might be obscured for us, is at times we're only capable of hearing the voice of the law. And, and here's where I have to be very careful. Because someone might object, but pastor, isn't the law a part of the word of God? Absolutely. And I'm not saying otherwise. But while the law is God's word, the law is never ever God's final word. But if the law for us becomes God's final word, or his primary word, or his only word, then we're going to miss the voice of Jesus. We're going to fall all over ourselves trying to find the one thing God says to us that will finally give us peace. That one act of devotion, that one level of piety. But if that's the voice of God we hear, it will never ever be enough. If the voice of the law replaces the voice of Jesus, we will either become self-righteous like the Pharisees, or we will fall into despair, unable to hear the voice of Jesus at all. In our efforts to do something more, or in our efforts to do something else, or in our efforts simply to do, we will miss exactly what Jesus is saying to us here in our gospel lesson this morning. Because finally, the outcome of John 10 for us this morning is that the voice of Jesus is the voice of the gospel. Again, the Pharisees asked Jesus, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ... Tell us plainly. Now what we might think happens here is Jesus just giving up and he's not going to tell them at all. Except that's not what Jesus does. The Pharisees ask Jesus to tell them plainly if he's the Christ. And what Jesus does is he tells them plainly that he's the Christ. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus gives his sheep who hear his voice eternal life. These are the words of Jesus. This is the voice of Jesus. And this is also the words and the voice of the gospel. The words we need to hear. Jesus isn't being coy when he tells the Pharisees that his sheep know his voice. He's not speaking in riddles either. What Jesus is saying is that the sheep of his flock are sheep that not only need to hear the gospel, but they are sheep that cling to the gospel once they hear it. They are sheep who have been killed by the voice of the law because of their own sin and failure, and they are sheep who are under constant attack by the world around them, despised by Satan and deceived by others. Jesus' sheep are sheep that desperately need to hear the words of life. And well, that's precisely what Jesus gives. And as it turns out, as Jesus explains to us this morning, this is exactly what God the Father has been saying and preparing us for all along. Jesus goes on to say, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The final mistake that people make who either fail to hear Jesus' voice and what he is saying, or want to listen to their own voices is to believe that Jesus' words somehow contradict what God the Father has been saying in other places in the Bible. If Jesus, this unimpressive man with a tender heart and gentle words, is really who God wants us to listen to, we might reason, why did God bother to thunder from Mount Zion? Why did God bother to judge his own people with plague and catastrophe and defeat and war over and over and over again until they were finally carried away from the promised land altogether? 
If Jesus is the voice we are to hear, if the gospel is the voice we're supposed to listen to, why does God condemn at all? Because the voice of the gospel and the voice of Jesus can only be heard if the law has done its work. If we think we can do it, we will only ever be looking for instructions and advice from God. If we think we have done it, we will only ever be listening to our own voices. But when we realize that we are nothing more than terrified, lost, helpless sheep, then what we need is a shepherd. We need someone to save us and bring us back to safety. We need someone to protect us from our enemies. And in that, we need someone to comfort us. And that someone is Jesus Christ. God's word of law is a good word. It is a holy word. But it is a word that can only condemn us because we are sinners. But Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly in our place. Our words can only deceive us. And Satan will only ever use our words and our sins and our failures to accuse us and kill us. But Jesus has defeated our enemy, sin, death, and the devil in our place. Jesus' words to us this morning are simple and they are beautiful. My sheep hear my voice, and I give them eternal life. That was the picture that Pastor Haugen painted for us this morning. And eternity before the throne of God. And the last dot to connect in all of this is that eternal life is the same life you have right now. When we gathered together as the church to confess our faith, we were confessing in that moment with the saints in the throne room of God. We were confessing in that moment wearing the same white robes that those who have died in the faith are wearing. We were confessing the voice of Jesus. The voice of the gospel. The voice of the Savior who gives us eternal life. Because we are the sheep of his flock. And... He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As we sing our response back to God for his word this morning, I invite you to stand. Turn in your hymnal to hymn number 566. We'll sing together, The King of Love My Shepherd Is. Hymn number 566. Who's good?
pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for a few short announcements. Reminder that youth group meets tonight at 7 o'clock at our house. Dinner will be served at 6.30 and we are serving tacos tonight. Uh, any announcements with youth group, Liz? We're good? All right. Uh, this Wednesday, May 11th, we continue our Bible study series on the book of Micah. That will be at 7.30 in the church basement and also on our YouTube channel. This upcoming Saturday, May 14th, WMF meets in the church office at 9.30 in the morning for their monthly Bible study. Next Sunday, didn't make the bulletin, but the 15th is our last Sunday of Sunday school. There will be no wind-down Sunday on the 22nd. So next week, normal schedule with Sunday school, May 22nd, just the worship service. Um, I and my family will be on vacation in two weeks on a trip down to St. Louis. We appreciate your prayers for that. Pray also for Pastor Gary Jorgensen, who will be preaching and leading the service for me on the 22nd. Uh, Thursday, May 19th, the council will meet in the church office for a council meeting at 7 p.m. There are also reminders in our bulletin that online giving is up and running and also of our ministry partnerships with Veep and with City Life Center to uh, meet the needs of the community. Are there any other announcements before I call on Liz? Okay, no other announcements. Liz? I have two things this morning. Uh, the first is the Christian Ed Committee would like to announce that this summer we again will be doing family fun nights. So one Sunday late afternoon, early evening each month, June, July, and August, we are planning to meet at someone's home or maybe at a park, and we will uh, invite anyone from the congregation, no matter your age, to come and join us for snacks, for a Bible lesson, for games, and just time to fellowship with one another. So this uh, takes place of vacation. Bible school for us, so it's an opportunity to continue Christian education throughout uh, the summer for everyone of all ages together. Um, we are looking for three families, individuals, couples to host uh, this summer, and the dates for family fun nights are June 5th, July 31st, and August 21st. Uh, so please check your calendars. Uh, if you would like to host, uh, we just need kind of a, an open yard where people can sit. Everyone will bring their own chairs or blankets to sit on, so you don't need to provide seating, uh, but just an open space to sit, uh, maybe play some games uh, to listen to a Bible story, etc. Um, and, you know, use of your restroom inside if someone were to need that, maybe inside if it rains, and a trash can for garbage from snacks or something. So not, not a huge commitment, but uh, would love to have uh, three uh, families or, or individuals or couples that would love to host on those. So let me know if you are interested in hosting, and I can get you more details on that. My uh, second announcement is as we are wrapping up another year of uh, Sunday school, want to give a huge thank you to all of those who led our various classes or helped or uh, filled in uh, as needed. And uh, the Christian Ed Committee does have gifts for each of our uh, Sunday school teachers and helpers and subs. Uh, those are located in the back on the table next to where the Carlsons are sitting. So as I uh, mention your name, 
name or right after the service, if I mention your name, you can grab uh, a little gift from the back table as a huge thank you uh, for just investing in the lives of our children and our youth and even our adults um, in educating us in the Word of God. So huge appreciation for, for all those who uh, volunteered and helped in that way. So uh, we had Allison Munfram who led the opening for the children and taught the pre-K class. Uh, Gerilyn and Andy Alsdorf and Maggie Smith uh, did the K and first grade class. Heidi Munfram and Jeremy Nelson co-taught the second and third grade class. Becca Nelson and John and Kristen Watson co-taught the fourth and fifth grade class. Pastor Jason led the adult class. Uh, I taught confirmation and uh, led youth group Bible study. Uh, we had some great substitute teachers who filled in, uh, Emily Carlson, Philip Munfram, and Danielle Freck. So you guys can feel free to grab a gift too. And then had some great um, helpers and subs for youth Bible study as well. So thank you to Troy and Nikki Hansen, and uh, Maggie Smith and Hannah Cree were Bible college students who helped with uh, uh, youth group throughout the year. And by the way, if any of you are concerned that Maggie and Hannah are gone, I already got them their gift before they left Bible College campus yesterday. So they, they are good to go. Um, were there any adult Sunday school subs that I should mention? Not this year. Okay, okay. Um, although, who did Joe and Pastor Steve, Joe, Joe Freck helped at adult Sunday school, so you could grab something. Joe Larson and Pastor Steve Munt from, did you guys do a class? During Advent. During Advent, right? So if you want, there's extras if you want to grab a thank you gift. We appreciate your helping with that too. So again, um, why don't we thank God uh, with a round of applause for those who helped with Christian education this year. Thank you very much. And Liz doing that reminded me that I wanted to say we, had, we did not have any seminary graduates this year who came through faith. There's only two in the class, Sam Willard and Scott Erickson. We did have two graduating Bible college seniors who came to our church regularly. One is not here, that's Jonathan Tweet. One is here, Danielle Freck finished her Bible school program and graduated. So, uh, oh, and Maria, in front, Maria did too. So uh, congratulate them after uh, the service. Uh, Bible school graduation is such a weird time because it happens on a Saturday and then everyone vanishes. Uh, so uh, uh, they have to move out, what, like an hour after graduation is done, you guys have to be out of the dorm. So uh, uh, we're grateful as always for the students who have come through uh, faith uh, and we're, we're looking forward to next year already. So thank you for being here. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Amen.